In February 2013, Tibet House opened Independent Tibet, an exhibition commemorating the 100th year anniversary of Tibet's declaration of independence from the Manchu Empire. Professor Tenzin Robert Thurman. Although His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama has chosen today the path of autonomy within the People's Republic of China, this exhibition demonstrates the previous independence that Tibet enjoyed for thousands of years always and legally in the modern sense from 1913 to 1950. I'm Robert Thurman and welcome to the exhibition displaying the evidence and the presence of independent Tibet following upon its thousands of years of being its own distinct culture and civilization. Now let's go down the hall and see the exhibition. Follow me. Here we have the great 13th Dalai Lama, Thupten Gyatso, became full-fledged Dalai Lama in 1895 after discovering in the early 1890s a plot to uh, poison him and kill him by sorcery, which had been the habit with Dalai Lamas by the corrupt uh, last legs of the Manchu dynasty, trying to prevent any particular Dalai Lama to work for Tibet, you know, to really see to Tibet's benefit. Here he is in Kalimpong, in British India, in 1912. And he was soon to return in triumph to a free Tibet, free of the incursions of the Manchu armies. The British invaded uh, Tibet in 1904, fearing that the Dalai Lama, this great 13th Dalai Lama was making a treaty with the Russians to protect Tibet from both the British Raj and the Manchu Chinese. So they invaded and uh, the Dalai Lama went to Mongolia. And then he, he, from Mongolia, he spent some year or so there. And then he went to Utaishan, a sacred place in Northwest China, sacred to Manjushri, where Tibetans and Mongolians and Chinese all went to worship Manjushri, the five mountains it is called. And eventually he was called to Beijing by the Empress. There he met all kinds of Western people. And so he began to realize that Tibet needed to sort of modernize. The holder of the Buddhist teaching, whose title was conferred by the Lord Buddha's command from the glorious land of India, speak to you as follows. I am speaking to all classes of Tibetan people. Lord Buddha from the glorious country of India prophesied that the reincarnations of Avalokiteshvara through successive rulers from the early religious kings to the present day would look after the welfare of Tibet. At the end of the Manchu dynasty, when they were really cranky, they kind of decided they were going to do away with the Dalai Lama. They were going to like do away with Tibet, actually. And they, since the British had gone in, they were afraid that somebody was threatening their control of Tibet. And the Dalai Lama had to flee again from the Chinese invasion in 1908-9, and he went to India to the British. He got to be friends with the British and he stayed there until the Manchu Empire then collapsed in 1911. And then he, his uh, people threw, threw out the Chinese troops, the Manchu troops left in Tibet, and he went back to Tibet and then he proclaimed the end of his relationship with the Manchu Empire. The declaration we have behind us, which we are celebrating now in 2013, as having been 100 years old, is his declaration that his relationship with the Manchu Empire was over. The Manchu Empire had a 300-year relationship with the Dalai Lamas, even though the Manchus were kind of protectors of them. They had what they called the priest-patron relationship, where the Manchu Emperor was a Tibetan Buddhist, and they considered the Dalai Lama as his guru, 
And so he was the patron of his guru. So then he, when the Manchus started attacking Tibet, though, he had to say, that's over. They are no longer, they're not going to colonize or imperialize us, pretending that they still are our patrons. And so it's over now, and we are independent completely. This was his move to be recognized by the world as an independent nation. He had always been recognized by his neighbors as an independent nation, but now he wanted the whole world. He realized the world was getting tied together from his visit in Beijing and in India. Peace and happiness in this world can only be maintained by preserving the faith of Buddhism. It is therefore essential to preserve all Buddhist institutions in Tibet. Just like the present Dalai Lama, it's the Buddhist culture of Tibet that makes Tibet special in his view. And so that's why it, it deserves recognition as a special kind of nation that it is. And in that light, he made a flag, a national anthem, a postal service, uh, mint, and he tried to develop a militia, and he picked the British form of, of military. Now I want to show you the flag, because this is a very important uh, symbol. He created this flag in 1916, uh, the 13th Dalai Lama, and he took this element of the two snow lions, uh, sort of the mythical snow lions of Tibet, and here they are holding on to the yin-yang symbol of worldly power, you know, the energy symbol. It's, it's not a wheel of dharma, it's a symbol of, energy, of the government, actually. And here is a symbol of the three jewels of Buddhism, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And that's the jewel of the culture, which they're holding on the lotus and a moon disc seat. And then from that, the sunrise of the Buddha Dharma, the rays of light of the sun, of the teaching of liberation and freedom and human evolution to the most positive condition, is radiating out from that and it sort of presents Tibet as the great Buddhist culture. And these different stripes of red and blue are the, from the different parts of Tibet, from Kham, Amdo and, and Uzang, the central part of Tibet. And then the yellow there is the rays of this sun, so it's sort of the, the, the light of Buddhism is to spread all over the world from this Buddhist culture and this Buddhist center in Tibet. And he purposely left one side without that yellow band to not make it self-enclosed. That is his reaching out into the world, and it fits with the 14th Dalai Lama's idea that Buddhism should not try to convert other religions and or even secular humanism, but that Buddhism should meet them and accept their knowledge and to engage with them to share spiritually the insights of other traditions and the achievements and the, and the teachings of them. The exhibition includes an array of photographs representing the infrastructure of Tibet's vast monastic cities and the government infrastructure of the early 20th century, decades before the Chinese invasion and Tibetan exodus of the 1960s. Tibet had always been known in Asia and respected actually by all the Buddhist countries in Asia, in Central Asia, China, Korea, and, um, and Nepal and so forth. It had always been known as a separate Buddhist nation with a particular culture. But the whole role of Buddhism in Tibet is so extraordinary that Tibet is the first country in which Buddhism became utterly mainstream. Even in India, the land of Buddhism's birth, maybe it was kind of mainstream during the Buddha's life. But after that, it had the Vedic thing and the Brahmins and the whole thing. So it was a countercultural force in India, even when it was in its flourishing time. So there's a very difficult skating, never skated before, Thalama's brother. And over here we have the Potala, this marvelous building built by the fifth Dalai Lama and finished by his spiritual son and his regent. Desi Sange Gyatso, after the fifth Dalai Lama passed away in 1682. The building of it was begun in the 1640s. It took a long time, took 40 years to build. In 1642, the Tibetan developed a monastic government. And Tibet developed a society, what I call, unique sociological form that has not been seen elsewhere in the world, actually, which I call a mass monastic society. So these great cities of the Tibetan monasteries, they look like cities, but they're actually celibate monk residences. 
And this was the great achievement of Tibet to demilitarize a militaristic empire on the power of the Buddhist vision of the purpose of human life. Therefore, you have these huge 10,000, 15,000, 8,000 person monastic universities. That's the Chakbori, which was the Tibetan medical college in Lhasa, where the Tibetan doctors were trained. This is the Labrang Monastic University, which is uh, in far northeastern Tibet. Nowadays, it's incorporated in the Tibet Autonomous Prefecture of Gansu Province. And then these are lamas standing on the roof of the Chakbori, the medical college. Parallel with Tibet's dynamic monastic life is the thriving agrarian life and economy of its nomads, farmers, and merchants. The exhibition includes sovereign Tibet's economy, monetary and postal systems, its government, and passports. Coming to this side, there are many photographs of the old Tibet here that we have. Look at these yaks and these people, and they're milking the goats here with a little missionary kid standing around the Gribenau kid. And this guy, he's selling some antlers, and uh, there's a the big market there going on. And the yak, for example, the wonderful animal here, the yak, that makes life on the Tibetan High Plateau possible, they, they are browsers, not grazers. That means they don't bite the grass and pull out the root like a goat. They lick the grass and leave the root intact. And so they make life possible. The Tibetan nomads are very wealthy, actually, and very able to live well. There's no recorded famine in Tibetan history. Look at the piles of wool. The British wanted to go there to get the wool, to get the salt. And here is Tibetan currency, the paper currency, printed by the great 13th Dalai Lama showing the currency of a sovereign government. The great kingdom of Be, of Tibet. The actual real name of Tibet is Be. And these are coins, marvelous coins. They have snow lions and mountains. And these are some officials in the Tibetan government. This is a picture of the Shakaba, who we know escaped and wrote a history of Tibet. This is the general Tsarong, who helped get rid of the Manchu troops after the empire collapsed, and had defended the 13th Dalai Lama when he escaped from the Chinese invasion. And so he was given a high position, and this is where they're trying to train the troops. The great 13th, the monasteries wouldn't let him really build a decent defense force. He had the idea after these invasions that it would be less violent to be able to defend your borders than it would be to be invaded and occupied and, and your resources taken away. But the basic reason it failed was the British wouldn't give enough arms and the head monks would not really pay the taxes. So the nonviolence theory is always with an interest in minimizing violence. So if you're strong enough to defend yourself, you're supposed to expel an invader and then not pursue them into their country and then make a treaty with them, uh, you know, when they, and showing restraint that they know you could pursue them because you had defeated their invasion, but you don't. You don't do like they did. And then you make a treaty where they won't invade you again sort of idea. Here's some of the stamp postage. They made postage stamps. And these are showing postmarks, and these stamps were accepted, and these were mailed into India, into the Raj, and into other places, which is kind of recognition. And then here we have passports that were given to foreign travelers in Tibet from the Lhasa government. These are real Tibetan passports going into Tibet. And here's Mallory, I think. This one is Mallory, who eventually, a famous one who died on Everest. Here 
here's the Tibetan government issue. Look at it. There's Sabah Shakaba in his Tibetan dress and his official's hat, that little flat hat. And here's the Embassy of France. This is Great Britain. And here's the Consul General of India acknowledging it, you know, in 48 after they're just independent. And here is a non-immigrant visa from Hong Kong. You know, we're stamping them as having a visa. And here, here is, of course, China itself, Nanking, stamped on Tibetan passport, acknowledging that. Through, here is this one consular section of the British Embassy, Nanking, allowing them to go to Pakistan, Iraq, and all British in transit through the United Kingdom. Here's uh, Honolulu, the U.S. U.S. Department of Justice admitted July 4th, 1948 to Honolulu. So that's the U.S. is stamping it. Here's the Consul General of France in New York. Cherbourg, here's entry into France. Stamp on Cherbourg. Um, Confederation Suisse. Here's a tourist visa to Switzerland, again on the Tibetan passport. These are all books written by different British who went there in the early period. This is really Tibet, you know. All this now is the Qinghai province, parts of Sichuan, Gansu, Yunnan down here, and they've carved it off from, from what they call the Tibet Autonomous Region. You see here, it's National Geographic. In 1934, there's the Tibetan flag. Right there with the USSR flag, the Yugoslavian flag, the Venezuelan flag, Uruguay, etc. It's there, but they never let them to the UN or the League of Nations. That's a page from within the National Geographic of 1934, showing that the real world recognized the existence of Tibet as the point. Beyond Tibet's indisputable sovereign identity, pre invasion, is the controversial and unresolved argument about the outstanding Simla Convention. And then here's the last point. The famous Simla Convention. Here, this picture shows the Tibetan officials uh, sitting here, and then some Chinese officials from the nationalist Chinese government. This is 1913 and 14. British officials from the British Raj. And they made a, a treaty with Tibet Nationalist China and England. And there was a three-way uh, dialogue and negotiation conducted in which the border of Tibet was altered in favor of the British. What is now called Arunachal Pradesh was given to the British by the sovereign Tibetan government. But since the British knew the Chinese pretensions concerning Tibet, there was a special provision in the, in the document that said that if the home government of any of these three plenipotentiaries did not ratify the convention when they went back to report its provisions, that that government would not benefit by any of the provisions in the convention, and it would be between whichever governments ratified it. So the Tibetan government ratified it, and the British government ratified it, and the Chinese nationalist government did not ratify it, and therefore they were not benefited by any of the provisions. Here you see Tibetan officials, it's the same Shakaba that you saw in that picture, visiting 10 Downing Street in the 1940s, trying to connect with the British. But long before that, after this time of this treaty, and after World War was over, the 13th Dalai Lama tried to send delegation to the League of Nations in Geneva to be recognized as an independent nation, and the British always blocked, and they wouldn't allow him to present his credentials. And this is a reproduction of the Simla Convention Treaty and the Tibetan version of it. This proves that the independent Tibet was recognized by the British government and was recognized by the Nepali government at the same time and was recognized by the Mongolian government, which were, all of which were sovereign governments at that time. And so what modern diplomats say, American, Japanese, everyone, that no one ever recognized independent Tibet, this is not true. 
the Chinese have felt for the last 60 years that they must suppress Tibetan culture because culture is what proves that the Tibetans are not Chinese. They don't have a Chinese culture. They have their separate, different Tibetan culture. They share Buddhism, different forms of Buddhism, but they are different in their culture. And so the genocide by the Chinese of the Tibetans has to do with seeking to eradicate Tibetan culture so that it will seem as if to others as if Tibetans were always Chinese. So they will not seem to have invaded in 1950 an independent country. Therefore, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, the great 14th Dalai Lama, who had to flee his country like the great 13th Dalai Lama did. The 14th Dalai Lama went to visit China in 1954, but then he had to flee to India in 1959 to save his life and to protect his people and to speak for his people to the world. Demonstrating Tibet's historic independence puts in proper context the extraordinary nature of the Dalai Lama's middle way approach. Despite Tibet's historic independence, he is willing now to become part of a federal republic of the People's Republic of China, with Tibet having realistic and genuine autonomy as promised in the Chinese constitution. The element of Tibetan culture, preserving the Buddhist tradition as its mainstream cultural backbone, is crucially important not only for the preservation of the Buddha Dharma, but for the survival of Tibet and the Tibetan people with their distinct identity. Therefore, His Holiness the Dalai Lama founded Tibet House in New Delhi as a cultural center and founded the Tibet House U.S. in New York as his cultural center in America. And following are Tibet Houses in Barcelona, Mexico City, Milan, Tokyo, Frankfurt, and Taipei all of which are cultural embassies for the Tibetan people.